NFTs. As I was saying, this is actually our first live in our digital streaming center here at KTAL News Now. So thank you so much for tuning in. We are going to go ahead and jump into this topic. As you are reading here at the top of our ticker, we are talking about the Taylor Parker trial in Bowie County, um, which she is accused of killing a new Boston mother and cutting her unborn baby from her womb. And so I'm going to go ahead and jump into this here and show you guys who I am joined with right now. I am joined by Carolyn Roy, our uh, court reporter. She is joining us here today, and we are going to go ahead and jump into what she's been seeing all week long. She's been there in Bowie County at that court and watching that trial piece by piece. So we're going to go ahead and dive in deep with her. She also uh, has the backstory, so we're going to go ahead and go back a little bit. Carolyn, can you jump in and uh, tell us a little bit about you know how we got to this trial in Bowie County? Right. Well, uh me on for your first Facebook live stream, by the way, Brittany. Um, it's been a long time uh, since I've been on camera, so I hope you will be able to speak uh, appropriately. Um, but one of the things that uh, you need to know about this trial, of course, is like you said, how, you, how it started. This happened back in October 2020, uh, when um, uh, on the morning of October 9th, a uh, uh, a young woman by the name of Reagan Simmons Hancock, 21 years old, 35 weeks along in her pregnancy, was found in her home by her mother um, uh, in a, what the arrest affidavit um, for Taylor Parker described as a gruesome, just a gruesome scene, very bloody. Um, she, her, her, Reagan was found face down um, in her home and there was blood everywhere and it would later be determined that she'd been stabbed more than a hundred times. She'd been bashed in the head and, and strangled. Uh, and then about 30, less than an hour before uh, Reagan's mother made that horrible discovery, um, a state police trooper um, in Idabel, Oklahoma pulled Taylor Parker over and found that she had a newborn baby in her lap with the umbilical cord still tucked into her waistband. Um, so the state police trooper, um, you know, called and had the uh, EMS come and fly the baby to the hospital. Um, the baby died. She was pronounced dead um, at the hospital and the personnel at the hospital also um, examined Taylor herself and determined that she had not had a baby. Um, so uh, it wasn't long before police realized that the discovery of this newborn under suspicious circumstances was related to the scene at Reagan uh, Simmons Hancock's house. Uh, and that's really where it all came out. It was uh, just six days later, um, Parker was actually uh, arrested and charged with capital murder and, and kidnapping. Um, in the baby's abduction as well, and that baby's murder. All right, thank you so much, Carolyn, for that breakdown there. Um, and so we're gonna continue talking about this, and I actually have some questions for her. So we are gonna go ahead and talk more about this. So I think one thing maybe I wanna know is, um, first day in the courtroom, yeah. what was the atmosphere like, and what were you um, hmm. seeing there? Well, it was a packed courtroom. It's not a huge courtroom. The 202nd District Court in Bowie County with, um, uh, is um, a, a fairly small courtroom, but you, a couple dozen people fit in the gallery, and there were almost no seats um, available. Family members were there, of course, for Reagan Simmons Hancock, um, and um, both close and, and it seems extended, and friends of the family. And uh, of course, uh, members of the media also filled out some of those seats. And it was, um, it, it was kind of striking how, how close uh, Reagan's family uh, seems to be and how they uh, were emotional, of course, during the opening statements and when the charges were read against um, Taylor. Um, there were some, some sniffles and, and some, you know, a little bit of, uh, tears um you know this has to be as you can imagine very difficult for the family um with you know going through this trial and having to relive some of those horrible uh days all over again and so uh 
but in the course of the trial, the family has also clearly, you know, they're not talking um, necessarily doing the interviews during the trial itself, but you can tell that they want to talk about Reagan, too. They want to keep her memory alive. As we look more into some of the evidence and details that um, both the prosecutor and defense have provided so far, could you tell us a little bit about maybe from the prosecutor side, what was some of the evidence that they provided so far? Yeah, there's been a lot of evidence. Um, reams of it, hundreds of thousands of pages of just digital evidence pulled from Taylor's devices, her laptop, her phone. Um, so there's been a lot of that evidence presented already. Uh, really that's been the focus of the testimony so far. First just establishing that Taylor wasn't even capable of getting pregnant because she had um, her two died uh, after the birth of her second child. Um, in 2014 and then I think the following year was when she had a partial hysterectomy after she had um, some problems with a sister on her ovary and when they went in they found endometriosis and a tubal pregnancy so while she was under the doctor came out and and talked to her husband at the time um, uh, Tommy Way Casey and said what do you want us to do because this is you know there are options here but one of them is that uh, his taking out her uterus and uh, what the the damaged ovary um, and that's when her husband at the time gave the go-ahead so she did not make that decision she was very upset about it when she woke up that testimony came out in court this week um, and uh, again all the digital evidence um, that was presented by investigators who did the search warrants and then analyzed it really got into what she was doing on social media when she was posting about uh, this pregnancy that several people, many people really, um, knew couldn't possibly be real, wasn't possible because she had had that hysterectomy. Um, it also is being used to set up a timeline for, so that the jury can understand what Taylor was doing on social media, what she was doing on her devices, um, and even text messages and emails that she was sending out under fake personas. She was using voice over internet protocol apps, basically spoofing apps to be able to text people under made up names, posing as everything from her own mother um, so that she could create um, the, uh, the impression that her mother was threatening and harassing her um, to posing as um, officials with banks uh, so that she could um, make it look like she was a millionaire heiress that she told her boyfriend who she, she was trying to keep that was the motive that the prosecutors say uh for the killing and taking of the baby um so she posed as other people and this digital forensic evidence uh allegedly she she did all this shows um the steps she took and she, it even shows her paying for these monthly subscriptions for these services and things like that um and that's just scratching the surface of the evidence they were describing forty nine thousand pages of digital evidence just for her Facebook activity alone, if I recall correctly. Um, that doesn't even include all the text messages and uh, those kinds of things that they also gathered as part of their investigation. And so I do want to say this to uh, the people who are tuned in right now. If you have any questions, feel free to give us, send us a comment, um, and we are looking through that right now so we can answer those questions for you right now. If you have any questions for Carolyn, um, also if, uh, you know, just also any technical difficulties, if you guys want to let us know, we want to make those changes so you can get this information. Um, but actually, I wanted to ask you another question. So um, also about, you know, who's testified so far? Who have we heard from um, throughout this week? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, there have been 17 witnesses so far from um, after opening statements on Monday through Thursday afternoon. And um, just FYI, the trial is only taking place uh, Monday through Thursday for the course of this trial, which is expected to last at least through the end of September. One of the reasons being the judge said he wants to allow the um, both sides to be able to prepare their cases because it is such a complex case um, for the coming week. Um, so four day trial weeks. Um, and so um, what was the question at? <laughs> No, all good, all good there. Okay. So, um, yeah, so it was just, you know, who has um, testified so okay. far. I know, so, so one thing we've uh, we've heard from the the first ex, Taylor Parker's first ex-husband, yes. is that right? Yes. Um, and apparently I heard that he said 
he tried to warn the new boyfriend of the lies there. Uh, I think that's what prosecutors say. Uh, do you have more on that? I do, yeah. So some of that digital forensic evidence um, showed the texts that Tommy Wade Casey, um, he spoofed his own number to text Wade Griffin, who was Taylor's boyfriend, that prosecutors say she was desperate to keep at all costs. Um, but Wade Casey didn't want uh, to wait to know who it was that was giving him the heads up that hey you know this pregnancy that taylor's claiming isn't possible because i was there when she had her hysterectomy and there's no way she she could be pregnant he didn't want her to know it was him tipping her boyfriend off because of the trouble it would cause in his life he was still taking care of um taylor's daughter at the time um even though she's not his biological daughter um that was the only father she'd ever known, and Taylor actually asked him to take care of her. So there were complications he didn't want to get into, but yeah, he, he texted uh, Wade Griffin anonymously, according to testimony in court and the evidence that was gathered that shows the texts. Wade was able to, um, or Wade Casey, that is, uh, was able to provide those texts to investigators. And one of the interesting things about that text that he sent to uh, Wade anonymously, so under a spoofed number, um, was also that uh, he told Wade that all the hospitals in the region were on high alert um, because the clinic, he didn't get into the details how he knew that, but we know from other testimony that the clinic itself um, that Taylor actually worked at, but also where she had the hysterectomy and the tubal ligation done, saw those posts that she was posting as well about her being pregnant and knew she couldn't be. So they actually warned um, the hospital where, where she'd said in those posts that she was going to deliver that baby because they were concerned about security risks. You know, on the stand, um, the doctor, uh, Dr. Christopher Mason, um, who again is a, a doctor at the clinic where Taylor was a patient and later worked, um, said that he wanted to make sure that the hospital took all the measures necessary to make sure those babies were safe because they were concerned if she was sticking with this pregnancy story what could happen next so um prosecutors say that that actually was a pivotal point in the timeline leading up to the murder that was in mid to late september i think september yeah literally mid-september that um taylor's ex-husband uh, tried to warn wade did warn wade griffin and Wade Griffin took that text and took a screenshot of it and sent it to Taylor. And within 15 minutes, prosecutors say, and the testimony said, that she was actually Googling information on out of hospital births because she knew there was no hospital in that area that she could go and, you know, go to to even fake having the baby for Wade's benefit. So, and from then on too, it showed that instead of, of looking for um, was it adoption, she was looking up information on like private adoptions. She looked up an article um, on uh, and found a story about a couple that found a baby on Craigslist. After that point, after um, Wade got that warning and um, showed it to um, Parker or Taylor Parker, she was moving in a different direction to try to come up with a baby in time for her due date, which, by the way, was right then. She had been telling people that she was due. I think one start due date was the 22nd of September. She might have moved it a little bit, but she was running out of time to come up with a baby. Okay. Um, so we have one question here from someone tuned in. They say, will Taylor take the stand? You know, in any trial, that's, um, I think most uh, prosecutors or, and, or defense attorneys, that is, will tell you, it's, that's a game time decision. That's what I've been told before. Um, if it uh, comes to that, um, it's a decision that is ultimately up to the defendant to choose to do that. Um, they can be advised by their attorneys, you, you shouldn't take the stand, but if they insist, they can take the stand or their attorneys might tell them they need to take the stand and it's still up to them. We don't know which way that's gonna go. It's also a decision that's really based on how things are going um, in the trial. You know, strategically, does the jury need to hear from the defendant? Will that help or hurt the case? So that's to be determined. 
So I know we've been covering this all week long and you've really been able to provide our viewers the latest information. So thank you so much for that. Um, what would you say is maybe the newest piece of information that you can pr provide everyone for today? Well, um, the newest piece of information would have been the testimony um, on Thursday afternoon before the court recessed for the weekend. So that would have been testimony from the clinic administrator where, where Taylor uh, was a patient, and as I said earlier, even worked for a little while in the office, um, which may have been one of the ways that she was able to get or have knowledge of um, how to do, uh, you know, patient procedures and whatnot. Um, but so in that testimony, she did also talk about uh, how they grew very concerned when they saw that Taylor was claiming to be pregnant and that she posted an ultrasound on her um, Facebook page and probably her Instagram too, if I recall, because it was mirrored. Um, and they saw that they ha it had the clinic's name on it. And so they were concerned because because of HIPAA, they can't really say who you know, they can't go around telling people Taylor P Parker is not pregnant um, because of a HIPAA violation. Um, but it alarmed them, and they did reach out to Taylor. And so um, Melissa Mason, the administrator of, of that clinic, re reached out to Taylor directly and said, hey, you know, you need to take this down. Um, and uh, Taylor came, I'm trying to remember what Taylor said to her. These were texts that were pulled from the devices. There might have been a Facebook Messenger conversation. Um, I think Taylor had some excuse for it that there were some so there was some drama going on and she was using that and um, to throw people off of um, what was really going on with her pregnancy Taylor Parker built this alternate universe with layers and layers like the prosecution described it as a, just staggering layers of fraud where she had fabricated stories built on fabricated stories and supported by these um, people made up either completely made up people or she would pose as real people um, to sort of block communication to block Wade from being able to get the real story from those real people because he thought he was talking to them but he wasn't so it's it, that's why this is going to take so long and why it has taken so long um, is just to get all of that laid out for the jury that she told all these stories and they interacted with each other and sometimes they did double and triple duty. Um, so that, that was supported in Friday afternoon's testimony um, with the clinic administrator. I'm trying to think of what else she said that came out of that. That was, that was probably the main thing, just their concern, the alarms that it raised that... Um, you know, while they couldn't out her because it would have violated her medical privacy rights, um, that they did reach out to, like I said earlier, the hospital and, and just let them know um, they needed to really keep an eye out. And yeah. again, that's what forced uh, Taylor to take this, what prosecutors say was the direction that she ended up going, which was, you know, stalking medical clinics and, and places where that she could find pregnant women um, it, apparently in search of her victim, who ultimately turned out uh, allegedly uh, to be Reagan. And so, again, if Taylor Parker is uh, found guilty, she is facing the death penalty. Um, so we, like we said, we've been covering this all week, and, and thank you, Carolyn, for um, giving us a deep dive into what you've seen so far throughout the week. Um, also, in our comment, you can see we have a link there, or in our post, we have a link to our website so you can uh, catch up on the latest information. We have a multitude of stories that have really um, piqued the interest of you guys, so you guys can see those latest information and the details on ktalnews.com, or you can also download our app at KTAL News Now. Um, so, is there anything else that you think um, maybe we can dive in a little deeper on? I mean, I know... Um, we dived in on the evidence and who's taken the stand so far. Um, any other other thoughts that you think you would like to still mention? Yeah, I think there are a couple of common questions that I'm seeing, and I'm, you know, I can try to answer those. One of them is, how did Wade Griffin not know that Taylor was pregnant? And the answer to that, apparently, and that was some of the testimony that was also um, uh, heard in court uh, uh, yesterday, Thursday, was that um, she hadn't, or Wade and Taylor's, 
relationship had grown rocky. Um, he had been hearing all the whispers that, and he also just knew that something wasn't right. Um, so he had his doubts, which was one of the reasons she fabricated all these stories and posed as all these people. Um, so he and Taylor had not been physical in quite some time. In fact, there was a moment in court when um, it was, it was ever, the courtroom kind of snickered because it, it, the, up on the screens, the, the prosecutors put up this lengthy text message that Taylor had sent Wade saying, um, you know, I need affection from you. Um, you're the father of this, my baby, or, you know, this is, I'm the mother of your child. Um, if, if this relationship is going to work, we, you know, I need the affection that you used to give me. It just went on and on and on. And his response uh, to that text was a thumbs up emoji. So he was cold to her, um, or at least distant physically. Uh, and so when she replied back, really, that's the best you can give me. That's all you're going to give me is a, a gesture that basically means whatever. And his response to that was an OK emoji. Um, and so in the, in the courtroom, I mean, there's nothing funny about capital murder and, and, and literally cutting a baby from a womb. But there's sort of some moments in the court where you can't help but just laugh at the ridiculousness sometimes of the exchanges or of the stories that Taylor told. I mean, there were some stories like the, I can tell you a couple of crazy stories about that if you have time for it but um you know some of the just crazy stories that were told on the on the stand but at any rate they weren't physical so there wouldn't have been any snuggling or who knows if they were even sleeping in the same bed but she certainly um hadn't been physically touched by him in some time because she was complaining about it uh, and the other thing is as receipts showed an online search um data showed she had searched for a fake pregnancy belly a silicone pregnancy belly and ordered one online and and she was wearing that so physically appearance wise if you weren't looking too closely she did she looked pregnant yeah and so um you know we, if you guys really like this facebook live like uh, carolyn said there's a lot more information a lot more stories that she can tell you so let us know if you like this and if you want to see more and hear more so and as we look ahead um carolyn can you tell us maybe what we can expect next week sure well one thing like i said you know is, is kind of the same deal as whether taylor will take the stand or not the, typically and in this case um, we have a general idea of what kinds of witnesses may come to the stand, but they're not going to tell us exactly who and exactly when. We do know that Reagan's mother is expected to take the stand um, next week. Uh, that could change uh, as, as maybe the prosecution's plans change. Um, but again, Reagan's mother is the one that um, walked in on that horrific scene and found her, her baby girl um, it, brutally murdered. Um, face down with the baby cut out of her womb. So um, we know that it's going to be especially difficult testimony for her. And I'm sure it'll be dis difficult testimony for her and her entire family um, when the jury has to hear, you know, the testimony about what crime scene investigators found there. Um, so that is next week. I would think, although we can't say for sure when, we'll hear from Taylor's mother, uh, who again, um, Taylor. Um, claimed was out to get her. She even claimed that her own mother put a hit out on her um, and, and made this fantastically outrageous story up about how uh, um, the middleman in that, in that murder for hire plot that she was telling Wade about, and that was to get Wade on her side, like, you know, my mother's against me, you know, and, and it worked. Um, Wade didn't want to leave her um, because of a lot of these stories. Uh, but anyway, um, the uh, murder for hire plot, like the Mexican mafia was involved, the middleman was like in a shootout, um, all that kind of stuff. So, so hopefully we'll hear from some more of those people involved, yeah. not, not, the big, not the people that she made up. Someone did actually ask if Wade will take the stand. Yeah, we're, I mean, I would hope and expect. But I know you, yeah, you said like we don't know who's yeah, coming, right? right? They, yeah. Yeah, they're not releasing that information, but... Yeah, and he, you know, that's a key. What Wade has to say about his perspective on this is obviously key to this case, hearing directly from the person that was at the center of, of Taylor's motivation for all of this. I would expect we'll hear from him. We just don't know when 
And again, this is going to go on through at least the end of the month. Yeah. Longer than that. Yeah. All right. So well, as more information comes out, we will definitely uh, jump on here again um, to give you guys more information. But you can also stay up to date on KTALnews.com. Thank you again, Carolyn, for joining me and doing this with me. Um, this was uh, definitely our first one, so it was nice to jump in and uh, give it a try. So thank you all for uh, being patient as well through the technical difficulties um, in the beginning. So uh, for now, we're going to sign off. I hope you guys have a good weekend, um, and yeah, we'll see you next time.